Hallo, so schön, dass du da bist, hier beim Podcast Heavy, Holy and Confident, dein Podcast fürs Herz und den Verstand. Mein Name ist Laura Marlina Seiler und ich freue mich so, dass du da bist und dir hier den Raum und die Zeit für dich selber nimmst. Deswegen starten wir auch direkt hier erstmal damit, dass du, wenn du möchtest, kurz einmal die Augen schließt, tief ein- und ausatmest. Und einfach erstmal hier bei dir ankommst. Wir sind alle den Tag über überall mit unseren Gedanken, mit unseren Sinn, mit dem, was wir tun. Und die aller Zeit, allermeiste Zeit so rum im Außen. Und es ist so schön und gut, zwischendurch einfach mal kurz diesen Check-in in, in dir selbst zu machen, weil deine innere Welt erschafft deine äußere Welt. Also so schön, dass du da bist. Danke für deine Zeit. Und hier erwartet dich jetzt ein so tiefgründiges, bewegendes, also ich, ich glaube, mit dem während des Interviews, ich glaube, ich habe dreimal, mindestens dreimal Tränen in den Augen gehabt, zum Schluss geweint. <lacht> ähm, ein so wunderschönes Gespräch mit John Strelecki. Er ist jetzt schon zum dritten Mal bei mir im Podcast zu Gast und dieses Interview ist dadurch entstanden, dass ich mit John vor was, zwei Monaten ungefähr im Sommer hier in Berlin ähm, Abendessen war, in einem ganz schönen Restaurant. Wir waren Abendessen, haben uns über alle möglichen Themen unterhalten. Irgendwann sind wir auf unsere Kinder zu sprechen gekommen und seine Tochter ist schon wesentlich älter als meine beiden Kids und deswegen habe ich ihn gefragt, hey, so, was sind deine, deine wichtigsten Ratschläge an mich als junge Mama, meine Kinder zu erziehen? Was würdest du sagen, hast du richtig gemacht bei deiner Tochter? Weil er mir eben erzählt hat, dass er so eine wahnsinnig enge Bindung auch mit seiner Tochter hat, auf so eine ganz tolle Art und Weise und sie ihm so viel anvertraut und erzählt und ähm, und dann war ich so, okay, John, bitte, 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 komm in meinen Podcast. Lass uns darüber sprechen, wie wir unsere Kinder erziehen und was wir unseren Kindern mitgeben. Und selbst wenn du noch keine Kinder hast oder auch keine Kinder hast, selbst dann ist diese Folge wahnsinnig wertvoll für dich, weil es natürlich ganz, ganz viel auch um uns selbst dabei geht. Und ja, viele von euch kennen John Strelecki. Er ist der Autor von Das Café am Rande der Welt, Überraschung im Café am Rande der Welt, Big Five for Life. Er ist, ähm, seine Bücher sind mit Abstand eine der meistverkauftesten Bücher in Deutschland und er ist ein so wahnsinnig toller Mensch, ein guter Freund von mir. Und deswegen sind wir in diesem Gespräch wirklich sehr, sehr, sehr tief eingestiegen und wir sprechen unter anderem darüber, wie wir die Intuition und das Selbstvertrauen unserer Kinder stärken können, welche praktischen Tipps wirklich dabei helfen, wenn du das Gefühl hast, dass du nicht zu deinem Kind durchdringen kannst, wie eigene Themen aus der Kindheit unsere Erziehung und unsere Kinder beeinflussen, so ein wichtiger Punkt, ähm, wie wir echte Offenheit und Vertrauen in der Beziehung zu unseren eigenen Kindern aufbauen können, welche Rolle Spiritualität in der Kindererziehung spielen kann und warum Humor der beste Weg ist, um Kinder zu erziehen. Und das sind unter anderem Themen, über die wir sprechen und ja, hörst dir an, teile es natürlich unglaublich gerne, wie immer. Ich freue mich riesig darauf, wenn wir uns ähm, bei Instagram sehen, at Marlina Seiler, folgt mir da sehr, sehr gerne, dann nehme ich dich immer mit, so in mein Leben und eine so Geile Neuigkeit, die ich gerne noch mit dir teilen möchte. Und zwar haben mich so, so viele immer gefragt, Laura, wann gibt es den IM-Kurs wieder? Der IM-Kurs ist ein Kurs, den ich auf Hawaii aufgenommen habe vor drei Jahren. Und ähm, es ist ein Kurs, der sich komplett auf die Lebensvision bezieht. Also wie du deine Lebensvision finden kannst. Und zwar nicht nur die Overall-Lebensvision, sondern in allen Lebensbereichen. Weil ich glaube, dass es Sinn macht, in einzelnen Lebensbereichen eine Vision zu haben, die du verfolgen und erfüllen, für dich selber erfüllen möchtest. Und weil so viele immer gefragt haben, Laura, 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 wann gibt es den Kurs wieder? Ähm, haben wir uns dazu entschlossen, den Kurs wieder aufzumachen. Das heißt, wenn du gerne in Kontakt kommen möchtest mit deiner Lebensvision, dann kannst du jetzt wieder bei IM dabei sein. Den Link dazu findest du natürlich in den Show Notes. Und es ist wirklich ein wunderschöner Kurs, der dich darin empowert, nicht nur deine Lebensvision zu finden, sondern vor allen Dingen, in Kontakt mit deiner Manifestationspower zu kommen und immer wieder dich zu fragen, okay, wer muss ich sein, wer darf ich werden, um diese Vision in meinem Leben tatsächlich Realität werden zu lassen. Denn, das war das, was ich vorhin am Anfang gesagt habe, deine innere Welt erschafft immer deine äußere Welt. Und ich wünsche dir jetzt dabei ganz viel Spaß und mit John Strelacki und wie wir glückliche Kinder erziehen können. Viel Freude! So excited and happy and grateful to have you on the show for the third time. Thank and, you. Um, first time together. First time together, which is beautiful. <laughs> and, um, same space. 
it's amazing. It's really, I'm, I'm really grateful that, that you took the time. Oh, I'm so grateful to see you, to have the chance to be together. And this topic is one that is near and dear to my heart. So, yeah. <laughs> so to give a little bit of um, introduction, maybe how we came to this topic. So we were um, having dinner in mm -hmm. Berlin. When was it like? Two months ago? Months yeah, I was ago. on tour with the, tour. the new book. But a yeah. new book? Yeah, that one, exactly. Überraschung. Yeah. Yeah, I just by coincidence had it here with yeah. me. Überraschung im Café am Rande der Welt. Your new book, you were in tour, so you were in Berlin. We met, we had a beautiful dinner. Yeah. And um, then we kind of came to the topic children. And you were telling me about your daughter and things you do with your daughter. And I was like, This is so amazing. Like all the things you said, I was, can you please write like a parenting advisory book? Um, and then we said, okay, let's, let's do an episode just about how you, how you are with your daughter and yeah. everything you do in a very special, beautiful way in raising her. And there, I, I already, I told so many people just the few things you told me <laughs> that day. I always go, yeah, but John Sturlecki, you know what he's doing with his daughter? <laughs> so, um, yeah. I'm, I should <laughs> caveat that by saying like, I, I'm not sure any of this will work with anyone else, but it works extraordinarily well between my yeah. kid and I. So, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, yeah, thank you also for opening up for sharing and totally. um, for for taking us into like your private home space which Absolutely. i think is a very sacred place so thank you yeah and let's just like dive right into it so, yeah and so for anyone who's like why is he is he have does he not remember what it was like to interact with this kid no i do it's just <laughs> that when we were talking about it what i did is i went back and one of the things i did from the very day she was born is i started to keep a journal a, a memory mm. book um, I type it, I don't write it out, but I keep a memory book of wow. my daughter. And I kept it for many, many reasons, um, mostly because I've realized in my life that you think you're going to remember everything. Mm. And four or five years after, you really don't. Like, you remember the highlights, but not the details. And I wanted to remember the details, not just for me, but so that when she was older and said, well, what was I like when I was five? And what was I like when I was two that I would have something to reference back? I will tell you, this is one of the single greatest things I have ever done in my life. When I, so I, when I knew that we were going to talk about kids, I went back and I read through it. I cried like a baby because it made me so many beautiful memories. And I was like, oh my God, there's so many cool stories and so many adventures that we had along the way. So I wrote them all down and that way I would have them. But this would literally be like three hours or more of content. So we'll cover what we cover. Um, just one quick question about the memory um, notebook you have so you, you do it digitally and then I just it, for everyone who's just listening yeah who maybe so wants to do I do it digitally like for well. the primary reason is because I didn't want to lose it mm -hmm. and so by doing it digitally I can just email it to myself mm -hmm. and therefore I know and I back it up on my hard drive and I know it's always there and it's not a chronology it's not um, you know December 1st uh, 2009 you did this this and this mm -hmm. it's more a special moment um, it was like her favorite TV shows at that point and how she sat at a little green table and a little green stool and she had this little plate that she, every time we ate fish she would use this one special plate and she would put the cheese in one part and the lemon in the other part. It's just stuff that when I read it it brings back so many beautiful memories and you know I wanted her to eat vegetables and eat healthy and so I was like oh Sophia let's create a whole new vegetable. She was like, we can do that? I said, yes, we are going to take broccoli, but we're going to turn it into something super special. We're going to create broccoli bites, <laughs> right? And all I did literally was like chunk the broccoli into super tiny little pieces, but I had her do it with me. And then we cooked it together. And I was like, I don't know, what do you think? Did we create something new? And it was just fun, you know? And so I look back at that single thing of like a special dish, special plate, and it reminds me of all of that. Wow. So yeah, it ends up being a love letter to your kid. Because every single every single time I write in it, I always am like, I love you, boo. Oh, yeah, that's so beautiful. So Thank I'm, you I for think sharing. I'm gonna give it to her when she's uh, like 18. Wow. Yeah, either 18 or when she goes off to college. I'm does, sure. does she know that? They, no. No. Wow. No. So she does know, and one she day you're no going idea. to give it to her. No. Oh my God, I would die. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. And so I know that there's always so many distractions. There's always a thousand things you got going on. Your inbox is full of stuff. And it's easy to do something like that. It's easy to want to do it and then not do it. Mm. But I will tell you, when I go back and read it, I'm so happy I did it. Ah, it's beautiful. I, I once, oh, oh, no, I didn't have the idea. What I did is I write my son a letter every birthday. Oh. So I, I sit down and I, I, 
I mean, there were only three so far, but um, it was very special for me to sit down on his birthday and to write him a letter and to tell him like what happened that year and what were special moments for me with That's him and beautiful. how he grew up. And I, it was the same thought when he's 18, I will give him this 18 letters. Like, and for my daughter, I'm going to do it as well. And um, yeah. I love that. I love that. <laughs> okay, let's 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 get started. So, what what is what is your first um, main thing you would say that worked out great with your daughter? What you did that maybe other parents don't do? Yeah, I will say this is one that is again they're all near and dear to my heart. But this is one that I've grown so much. You know, people often ask me, "Well, what do you teach your daughter?" Let me tell you. If you're not a parent yet, but you're thinking about becoming one, or you're open to it as a parent, your kids will teach you every bit as much as you will teach them, mm -hmm. if not more. That's true. And I grew up in a household where my father was very vocal. He would yell a lot. He was a very loving man in his way, but part of his demeanor was he would yell. And he had three kids under the age of, he was 26, he had three kids under the age of five. Hey, if that had been me at that point, like I might have been just like that. But because I grew up in that environment and it didn't it didn't resonate with me, and I'm very auditory to begin with, and just that whole experience left a lot of trauma there, that on the day that my daughter was born, I was in the hospital, they hand her to me, you know, would you like to clean her off? And I looked down at this tiny little human being, and I can't believe, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm woefully unprepared for this, <laughs> is pretty much what I was thinking. But I looked down at her, and my intuition was just screaming at me to say something to her. And what I said to her was, I will never raise my voice to you, mm. never. I challenged myself to find another way, always. And so the beauty of this is that when we went through the two-year-old phase and everyone's like, oh, terrible twos and like that, that, that. And so what I discovered is that when she was vocal and trying to figure out her parameters, if I got down on my knees so that I could be eye level with her, not being intimidating at my height, and I looked at her and I said, boo, does daddy talk to you that way? And her little brown eyes and her little sad voice, no. And I said, all right, so please don't talk to me like that, okay? I had to do that two times. That was it. And so I believe in rewriting the rules as a parent and doing it your way. And so she is now 15 years old. I've never raised my voice to her. And I'll tell you an example of where this comes up, where it challenges you and how you grow from your kids. So she was three and a half years old. It was time to brush teeth. And you know how they have the little stools so they can reach the sink. Well, she decided in her playfulness that she was going to jump up and down, up and down, up and down off the stool. I had had a horrible day. A business partner that was supposed to get something done didn't get it done. Left me in the lurch, all kinds of extra responsibilities. Project was important to me, wasn't going to happen, and I was pissed. And so here she is jumping up and down, jumping up and down, and I feel inside of me this urge to just be like, stand on the stool and brush your teeth. I, f I mean, I feel it at every cellular level because this is what was told to me in those moments, right? Mm. But because I have made this commitment to myself that that is not who I am, I was forced to be in my body and outside of my body at the same time and asking myself the question, is it really her? And the answer was no. It had nothing to do with her. As a matter of fact, what she was doing was ridiculously cute. And so this to me is one of the greatest things that we can do as a parent. If you can put a tiny filter between your brain and your mouth, and when you have these thoughts which almost seem instinctual, to just think for a second, is this really who I am as a dad, as a mom, and who I'm choosing to be? Or is this like old code? Is this, I'm just reenacting the behavior that I experienced when I was a kid. To me, this is one of the greatest things ever as a parent, because you grow so much, and you get to have a healthier relationship with your kid. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, do you have something like that that you've implemented, that you employ? Um, well, I, I try to be really aware of what you also just said, that it's never about my kid. Like, mm. it's, it's never about my kid. <laughs> it's my emotion. It's me. It's inside <laughs> of me. And I, I, I know this so well, what you just said. Like, you come home, you're, you're, you're tired, you're, like, empty. And then your kid is, like, really not doing what you want them to do. Yeah. And to be in this emotional self-awareness of, being able to regulate yourself in that moment to not act on this primary emotion kind of that wants yeah. to explode 
I think this is one of the most difficult, toughest things, but it's so it beautiful when you can do it. And I, I think it's it's not only with your children. I mean, it's totally. in every situation with every human being you react totally. with. Yeah. That so often we yeah, kind of um, cannot regulate our emotion in that moment and we just act on it. And then we create like trauma and conflict on the outside because we yeah. had it in the inside. Yeah. So my general philosophy, I call it transference. When I take the energy that has happened somewhere else and I then transfer it to the person who happens to be closest to me. And what I've realized is very often in our everyday lives, if we're not careful, if we're not conscious, if we don't put that little filter in, we have a nasty habit of taking the anger that someone else generated over here. And because we don't feel comfortable redirecting it back at them, we save it and give it to the people who we know will forgive us. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's so true. And my philosophy on that is, listen, your kids will forgive you for almost anything, mm. but it's not necessary to keep asking them to prove it. Yeah, it's not necessary. Yeah. So if you're going to get angry at somebody, get angry at who's making you angry. Yeah, it's true. But don't redirect it. Don't transfer it to the kids. So That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, it's been something that has really been very rewarding to me. And as you said, that general approach to life extends way beyond just your, your kids. Like that mm -hmm. extends to everybody. Yeah. But um, just for everyone who's listening right now and who maybe have similar experiences where you just feel like this wave of emotions yeah. coming up in that moment. And I mean, sometimes I don't know how it's with your daughter, but I mean, my son, he's the cutest. He's, he's amazing. And there are sometimes moments when, when he's not listening and yeah. he's just like freaking out and doing things. And um, I think it's, I think I'm kind of good at it, but sometimes I also feel like, okay, I, I don't know what to do. Like, do you have these moments where you feel like, like, tell me someone what yeah. to do now because I can't right. reach my kid in this moment. So I've employed a couple of different things for that. One is that I learned very early on, and again, every kid is different. And so this works for me. I'm not saying it worked for anyone else, but I've seen it work very effectively, which is setting as many expectations as you can. And so if you know that you're leaving in 10 minutes and they're sitting and watching TV or coloring or doing whatever, to let them know, okay, just so you know, we're gonna leave in five minutes. That small little indicator of what the future is about to become goes over way better than, okay, we gotta go. Oh yeah. The we gotta go just sends kids into a tizzy. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like, psychological reasons why that is it's the massive uncertainty all of a sudden and kids like certainty they like structure they like freedom too but they like to know the parameters and so that works really and continues to work really well for me is okay in this many minutes this is going to happen and what's hilarious about it is that when your kids are two or three they have no concept of time so it's not, yeah. it's not like they I even know what thinking, five minutes yeah. is but what they do know is that this thing that i'm doing is going to come to an end soon and then we're going to go do the next thing. Mm. And that seems to be enough to calm them down. Mm. The other thing I would say is that I found when it's just bubbling over, Laura, I just go silent. Mm. And I just sit in my space emotionally, mentally, <laughs> and I just am quiet. Because I know the opposite is going to be completely counterproductive yeah. for me. Um, but the quiet is okay. Mm. And the last thing I would say to this uh, is that I do my very best and have done my very best from the very start to be brutally honest. And I use a term called energy bar. And so when I am in the position that we were talking about, I'm done for the day, man. <laughs> like I just have nothing left in the tank. And she says, would you like to, or can you, or can we? First of all, my answer is always yes. So I never come up with a straight no. But if I just have nothing left in the tank, I'll say, you know what, boo? I would love to do that with you. Right now, my energy bar is at one. And I'm so sorry about that, but my energy is a bar is about one. But I'll tell you what, tomorrow morning, first thing after you wake up, I guarantee you will do it. Mm. And this seems to set everybody at ease. Mm. I don't feel like I'm failing as a parent. She feels good because she knows we're gonna do it at some point. And uh, if your kid has some degree of empathy, which almost all kids do, they actually reach over and give you a massive yeah, hug. It's like the coolest thing ever, you know? And then they can, they can use that same language back to you. So when their energy bar is at a one, 
they learned that it's not just about reacting, mm. but they can just turn to you and be like, you know what, mommy, my energy bar is a one right now. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I love that stuff. So there was one thing you told me when we were walking, when I was walking you to the hotel, um, you were talking to me about how you were strengthening the intuition of your daughter. Mm. Can you maybe tell that again? Like yeah. how you do it when you're with her in a city or like letting, making her choices? Yeah, totally. I, you know, this is one of those things I wish I'd have known better when I was a kid, because I think we are all born with this intuitive gift. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to see what has not happened yet even, let alone know what's happening around you on such an energetic level. And my understanding is that kids are unbelievably absorbing. They're like total little sponges. If you give them the freedom and the flexibility to figure things out with a little bit of framework, like they're spectacular at it. So from a very young age, I would ask my daughter, what is your intuition telling you? I would use those exact words so that she understood the concepts. And I think at some point I probably explained what intuition was. I don't remember that. What, what did you day. tell her? What, what I, my guess is that I said to her, you know how you sometimes have a feeling about something and you just know that it's right, but you can't quite explain why it's right. That's your intuition. And so it's really important to trust your intuition because that's your inner guide. I'm sure I did a better job of it. I hope I did than that, but that was the essence of it. Mm -hmm. And so then when we're in a different place and she has a question about something, I'll just be like, I'm not sure either. What's your intuition say? And I'll let her take the lead and tell me what her intuition is saying. And then I'll go with that. And so that she learns, whoa, it's a good thing to trust my intuition. And it's not just that adults have it and kids don't, but like we've all got it. And now it's just kind of wired into her. You know, she's very, it's very effortless in the way that she does it. Do you ever like talk about it, how, how it's for her today? Uh, Or how yeah. it's maybe helping her in, it, in her life? It, it's, it's such an everyday part of our dialogue. Like that word, I don't know, what's your intuition telling you? Okay. Is, is well, like a very common theme in decision making, in well, evaluating options. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I did one when, when she was two. This is a combination of intuition and just building their confidence. but. We, I, I started doing adventure days with her when she was two. Twice a week, I would pack the stroller, the diaper bag, the food bag, everything, and just she and I would go off for the whole day. And there's a thousand reasons in a busy schedule why you just can't fit it in. And let me tell you, there are a thousand and times infinity reasons why you should totally do it because it builds tremendous bonds. You'll never get that time back again. And They won't remember exactly what you did, but the energy that you create and the bonds that you build and the relationship that you build with your kid, you know, now she's 15. And so now we still do adventure days, but the conversations are about such amazing, deep topics, um, sex, sexual orientation, relationships, what it's like to, to be older as a girl. And we just have this dialogue, but I don't think we'd have that if we hadn't developed that over all the years. But when she was two, I remember I took her to this park and there was this big retention pond It was like a wading pool kind of thing, a reflection pool. And she said, can I go and walk on the steps along the edge of it? And there was like these bricks. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, what do you think? She's like, I think I can do it. So let's go. Now I had to change the clothes in the bag. I had another diaper in the bag. Like worst case scenario, I'm only four feet away. So if she falls in, I grab her and pull her back out. But you'd have thought, judging by the reactions of the people around me, you'd have thought I had her on the top of a 10-story building and was like, all right, I don't know. I think you can do it. Jump off, you know? Uh, so they were all just like freaking out and gasping and the rest of that. But to me, that's such a small risk. Again, she falls in, I pull her out, change her clothes, and we go on with the rest of the day. But if she doesn't fall in, think of the confidence that she's built. Think of the connection she further connection she made to her intuition and her physicality there's no price tag you can put on that kind of stuff so yeah i firmly believe in giving your kids those kind of opportunities and i think it's so interesting because our kids are so brave and yeah. they're so like they want to explore and they're curious and so often we like we are projecting our fears on them and they didn't even had them until yeah. we gave them to them yeah so I think this is a great gift we can give to our children to to not tell them to be afraid of something where, where they actually don't have to be afraid of. Yeah, you know, it's it's such an interesting conundrum because you love them so much. Yeah. And you want to keep them from pain. 
and you want them to be happy and whole and yet you're 100% right. I think the same thing that if you don't let them fall down every once in a while, they're not going to have the confidence. As, and I think as they get older, I've noticed this now with my daughter being a teenager, that when you actually, as the kids get older, catch them from making mistakes and fix everything for them, that in essence, on an unconscious level, what they're absorbing is, you don't think I have it in me. You don't think I have the ability to make this decision or to do that thing. It's the exact opposite of what we're hoping to create, which is an independent, confident, self-sufficient, comfortable in their own skin human being. Mm -hmm. There was one thing you talked about, which is defining a new normal. Yeah. Uh, can you can you go there a little bit deeper into into that topic? Uh, I'll talk about it from a dad perspective. Uh, my dad used to celebrate and brag about the fact that he had never changed a diaper. He had three kids. Now, granted, it was a different era, and people saw their roles differently, and the rest of that. Before I became a dad, I thought this is going to be the suckiest part of being a parent ever. Changing a diaper, like that's got to be the worst thing ever. And then my kid is born. And here I see this tiny little ball of love that's my kid. And the opportunity to change a diaper, she can't change it on her own. She's a helpless, tiny little infant. And the fact that I get to help her in that moment is like an unbelievable gift. And that applies to whether it's she wants something to drink, she needs a snack. I, this is a chance to be there for this tiny little human being because they can't do it for themselves. I, I found the whole experience to be so reframed. You know, I actually wrote a piece one time about the joy of diaper changing. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, when it's your ninth one in the last three hours, <laughs> it probably doesn't have the same thrill to it. But the point is that If you look at it as a gift of love that you're helping out this tiny little human being, it totally reframes it. Mm. And I, one of my favorite things ever was when she was totally tiny. Remember when you had to give them a bath in the sink? Like they're so yeah, little, course, they yeah. can't. Yeah. And so I would give her a bath in the sink and I would wrap her in this little, this little bathrobe kind of thing that had a little hood. She looked like a little burrito by the time you got done wrapping her. And then I would take her to the changing table to dry her off and I would tell her a story. I, I made up this story about the monkey and the parrot. And then it would always end the same, which was, and the monkey said, tummy kisses. <laughs> and when I got to the line, tummy kisses, I would give her tummy kisses and she would giggle and laugh, right? And what was so cool to me, again, your kids teach you, is that, again, she's like six months old, right? Can't speak, can't walk, can barely crawl, but she learned comedic timing. Mm. Because I would tell the story and when I would say, and the monkey said, She would start giggling yeah, even before well. I did. And I'm like, that is so insane that their little brains are absorbing and processing all of that. Wow. So you can take something as ridiculously seemingly nothing as giving your kid a quick bath mm. and it can be a moment. Beautiful. Yeah. So um, one thing you also talked with me about when, when we were having dinner and you mentioned it now as well is that When you have the adventure days with your daughter, yeah. you talk about sexuality, you talk about her period, you talk yeah. about like being with boys, everything, which I think is amazing. Like yeah. I never had a conversation like this with my father either ever. Either with either of my parents, um, yeah. So maybe we can go there a little bit. How did you create this trust with her that she also opens up with you? And like, but also how is it for you to be talking with her about it because yeah. i think this is also a different or a difficult topic sometimes as a parent uh, to talk about them having sex one day and yeah 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 you know it's crazy in that because you love your kids you want them to experience the joy of these different things i look forward to the day that she experiences her first kiss mm. you know i mean do you remember that like your first kiss yes. ever your yes, first hand holding with that person that you're like oh my god i love them <laughs> they love me <laughs> Like, that is like every human being on the planet should get to experience that, That's true. you know? And so I look forward to her experiencing those things mm. and I want to do my best to prepare her for those things. I, one of the things that I did very early on, which I think answers your question of setting up that relationship is, uh, and, and little kids have their preferences. So at one point, I don't remember the exact years, but it was like all mommy, like all she wanted was mommy, you know? And so I was just, I didn't feel resentful about that. We did our adventure days, but like at nighttime, it was just like, I just want mommy. And that was okay, right? Um, but I started reading with her when she was about two and a half and we would read together every night. And then reading turned, this is like a, a, a familiar trend in my relationship with her in that 
reading would turn into something much more fun than just reading. That alone was cool, but as she got a tiny bit bigger, it was tango. And so she would stand up, she had a, instead of a crib, she had a bed on the floor with no box spring. So it was just like mattress on the floor. So she would stand and be like, tango daddy. <laughs> and so I would hold her arms and we would tango along the edge of the bed. Aww. And they would tango on the edge of the bed back. And then it would tango on it. And then this turned into a uh, spot grab. Spot, she invented all these games. So spot grab was where she would lay on the bed and she would grab with all her might. And it was my job to move her. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I, I think it was, you're building trust, you're building memories, you're building traditions. And so at this age that she is, we still hang out right before bedtime. And we, at this point we just talk, you know? And it's in these moments where she often is like, here's what I'm going through. And I'll just be like, how was your day today? What was the best part of the day today, you know? And it's now so natural that these conversations just happen. Yeah, you're totally right about it. like when she came to me, which I was 12, 13, whatever she was, and yeah, I just got my period today, Dad. Like in my household growing up, like that, that conversation <laughs> would have never happened, like not in a million years. Yeah. So I, I'm treading new water. So to your question of how do I feel, at times I feel like vastly outgunned in terms of knowing what I'm supposed to do in these situations. So I listen. I just listen. And every once in a while, I'll be like, can I help in any way? And if she needs help, she'll ask for it. But otherwise, I just listen. So if someone is listening right now and there's a dad or a mom and they would like to create this trust with, with their child yeah. um, and maybe haven't done it yet and would like to talk with them about all those topics and would love that their kid to come to them and yeah. say the same things, what, what can they do? How, how can parents maybe start if they missed to create it yeah if before. they're a little late in the game yeah the interesting thing about being late in the game is that you're gonna have to work twice as hard to build the trust if not 10 times as hard to build the trust because if it hasn't been established yet then the default at this point probably is like i'm not so sure mm -hmm. you know the, from the kid's perspective mm -hmm. yes, i'm not so sure we can have this conversation and so you'll probably have to put yourself out there 10 times in a row and get rejected before the 11th time and they open mm. up. And I will tell you that if during the 10 times that you're getting rejected, if you lash out back at them, it's game over. Mm. Like they're asking you to demonstrate. You're saying to me, you're really serious about being there for me and that we can have this conversation. And they're going to test and test and test to make sure that's true. And if you fail the test, it's game over. So you need to really stay focused on, on kind of what you promised and yeah. 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 And if it's, you know, if the conversation isn't happening that day, that's all right. It'll happen the next day mm -hmm. or the next day. But if your ego is based on the fact that they are going to tell you, mm -hmm. forget it. Yeah. Right. Because they're going to sense that energy and realize, oh, it's actually about you and not me. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, when you were writing down your notes, was there one particular story or memory that came up that did touch you like oh my gosh, by a surprise so maybe? Yeah. Or where you were like, oh my God, I, I couldn't even remember. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, so my gen this falls into my category here of making stuff fun. Okay. And so I'll give you two examples that are off the top of my list. Oh, three, because this other one, like, I love this one. <laughs> uh, so uh, when she was, I don't know, three, four years old, whenever they're starting to learn numbers, I guess mm -hmm. four probably, um, we invented a game called Sophia Ball. And Sophia Ball was we would go out to the driveway and we would, so we had a basketball hoop that you could lower mm -hmm. to look quite low. And then we took a bucket and there was a planter out there for plants. I don't know why that was even out there. And then we had the trash can. And so she invented that you would put the bucket on the trash can. And so we came up with a point system. So if you actually scored a basket, it was worth three. If you took the ball and you chucked it at the bucket that is sitting on top of the trash can and you knock it off, that's worth two points. And if you can run and put it in the planter, that's worth one. All right. We used to play this game all the time. And what is amazing about this, the reason that I was partly inventing this game is I wanted to try and help her learn numbers. And so I would have her keep score. And so this is a great way to, for them to learn math. Like they're at, oh, dad's got two points. Wait, did you just score a one? How many do you have now? 
you know? And so you can just incorporate it into the whole game. Mm. But yeah, she actually got to the point where she was a real legit basketball player and she would still say to me, can we go play Sophia Ball? Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. Um, and then another example with food, uh, obviously I wanted her to be exposed to healthy foods. And so in general, I think kids are like open to the idea, but you have to sort of find them in their way. And so uh, with blueberries was the thing. And so I don't remember again, she was like three or something. And so I would be like, man, Sophia, did you see the size of these blueberries? Look at this one. This is like, I think this might be the biggest blueberry I have ever seen. And then I would turn away and I'd be like, I hope a little squirrel doesn't come over here and steal this one. Because if a squirrel stole this one, I don't even know what I would do. And of course, what do they want to do? They want to steal it, right? So she comes over, she grabs it and eats it. I was like, what happened to my blueberry? <laughs> well, I'm going to get the second biggest one out of the container. I get the second biggest one. I hope a little squirrel doesn't come over here. These little games that you invent, the goal is just to get trial, you know? And then of course, if they love it, but the cool thing is that when you invent that kind of a stupid, silly tradition, they will carry it on for years well past they know that it's a silly game. And that's awesome. So I'll give you one more. This is like one of my all time favorites in that, you know, when they're like, I think it's about two that they can toddle around. And so she had her mattress on the floor so she could get up in the morning and just come over to the master bedroom. And of course I could hear her coming. And so I would hide myself under the sheets and I would pretend that I wasn't there. And she would crawl up and muscle her way up to the bed. And then I would just stay hiding under the sheets, hiding under the sheets. And then she would come over and she would pull the blankets back, right? And she thought that was the most fun <laughs> thing ever to be the one who discovered where you were. And this would transition into the king and the, and the land of stuffed animals. So after she had pulled back the sheets, she literally would run all the way back to her room. She would get a whole bunch of stuffed animals, bring them back. This was the kingdom of stuffed animals, but I was the king in the kingdom who was the sheet stealer. <laughs> and so inch by inch, I would take the sheet and I'd be like, oh, oh I'm the king of the sheet. Like, it's just stupid, it's silly, but they love this stuff, you know? They love this stuff. And I think that it gives, parenting is like the biggest excuse to be a, a nut, a goofball, a silly person. It's true. Yeah. Um, I remember when I tried to teach Carlo to use the toilet and not to use diapers anymore. We had like the fun of our <laughs> lifetime. Like, I, like the toilet was talking, you know, and um, like all his animals went to the bathroom in his cars and had to pee. And, <laughs> like, and it was like the bathroom was just like the, the playing room and he was just sitting there cracking up. And of course, like one time he was just like, I want to go there too. Like if, if all in the toilet was like, hello, Carlo. And so we were, we just, and it was like the funniest time. And then yeah. of course it just took like a month or something and he didn't want to use diapers anymore. Yeah. And I remember that so many people were asking me, like, Laura, how did you do it? Like, how did you make him, like, not using a diaper anymore so quickly? And yeah. I was just like, yeah, because he had so much fun. It was just like, he was so excited to go yes. to the bathroom. And it was never about, you have to use now the toilet. It was right. like, okay, let's make this the best experience you ever had in your life. And yeah. still today, we make so much fun when he goes <laughs> pee. It's, it's just always really funny. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you that this is where the worlds intersect of the things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So right, right now he remembers it. When he's 10, he probably won't. Mm -hmm. But when he's 18 and you give him that letter and it's part of the letter, I think that his neural net will go all the way back and remember that moment. Yeah, probably. Which is so cool. Yeah. And I, I, I just feel that humor is the best way to educate your child. Yeah. Um, or also to help them sometimes to understand things. And um, just yesterday, Carlo had like, I, I never had this before with him, but he had like this craziest outburst of being angry. Like I never had that. It was, yeah. it was like over the top. And um, like I tried everything to calm him down. And then I just took him to the bed. I was holding him and he was screaming at me. And then, I don't know, I, I made a joke. I actually don't even remember what I said, but I, I just made a joke and I, I could see how like his mouth was like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm on the right track here. So um, I said something else which, which made him laugh. And within like literally 15 seconds, he went like from being this most angry kid in yeah. the world to cracking up and just lying there. And, and it was so beautiful to see that how with just being 
without being judging him for being yeah. angry or something, holding him, but then also helping him to guide towards like another emotion, yeah. which helps him relax his like nervous system. And yeah. yeah. And I think at that age, once you've helped them make that transition in that moment, maybe it's not exactly at that moment, but maybe then at bedtime, mm. you're like, you know, I love the fact that, and I always, I, I always do the positive reinforce. I think you raise a champion by positive reinforcement, whether you're, Raising it, and whether an athlete is trying to become a champion, whether you're trying to help your kid be uh, you know, just live the life of their dreams, that positive reinforcement is the thing. And so, in that moment, I can totally see you having the conversation. You know what, bud? I love the way you transitioned from being really upset to happy. Mm -hmm. And I saw that it was because you allowed yourself to laugh at the mm. moment. Uh, so you really, with your daughter, you really expressed that, yeah. like, oh, 100%. wow, hundred percent. 100 percent. okay that's beautiful yeah. yeah i do that today with him when i see him yeah I tell him. and then the other aspect of that is so then the next day when you're doing a play date and another parent is at the house and of course he's there and he's busy playing with his friend when you know he can hear you tell the other parent yeah you know he did such a good job yesterday he was really upset about something man I can't believe at his age that he's already aware that he can change from that angry state that he was in to a happy state by just laughing at the moment. He did such a good job. You're not telling him, but he can totally hear you. Wow. Yeah. Kids react to the I positive, as you know, to the positive reinforcement. This is so important what you just said, because I think what many parents do is the opposite. They mm -hmm. talk about their parent, about their children in front of other people but not in a good way they talk about this stuff yeah, yeah. they criticize them and yeah. complain about them complain about their own kids yeah. yeah and they hear it yeah so i think it's really super important to be aware what you say in front of your kid yeah i think if your goal is to raise a self-confident adult uh, and to get there they are a self-confident kid mm -hmm. i would really push yourself as a parent to never ever ever criticize them in front of someone else Mm -hmm. um, you talk about, you were saying, so what does that trust look like where they can have that conversation? Mm -hmm. If you've ever done that with your kid, you're going to have to give praise a hundred times before they will trust you. Wow. Because they will absorb that. And, you know, mommy and daddy are the people who are supposed to love me the most. And if they think I'm a failure, man, like, that's traumatic, horrible. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure what you gain either by doing it. I'm not, I'm not sure what the intention would be. Like, what do you hope that you're going to gain by doing that? Yeah, I think very often it's just letting Maybe that was the way when they were a kid. Yeah, you know? maybe that and also just letting it out, somehow being not able to deal with it and just, yeah. Yeah, so if you feel the need to vent, and sure, everybody's got moments where they just need to get something off their chest. Hey, find someone and do your venting. Just make sure that it's not in the presence of your kid who can hear that. It's just, it's a no-win situation. It's a 100% lose situation. Mm. Talking about failure and making mistakes. So how did you help your daughter um, not being afraid of making mistakes and trusting herself? I would say that, I mean, I, you know, again, trust me, I am far from perfect at this stuff. I'm just doing the very best I can uh, with what I know, what I discover, what I learn. When a child expresses an interest in something to allow them to further walk down that path I think goes a long way towards trusting their own intuition mm -hmm. and also giving them a chance to succeed along the way. Um, a recent thing for me, and I can think about one that when she was younger, but a recent thing is music. I'm not musical, you know? I wish I was. Uh, my parents tried it when I was little and I was much happier out there running around with a basketball in my hands. I just didn't have the patience to sit there and do that. My daughter is incredibly gifted physically with sports. She's got ridiculous hand-eye coordination, but she doesn't love it like I loved it. Mm. And so what she does love though is music. And so she literally decided one day she wanted to learn how to play the ukulele. And I said, are you sure you want to play? And she said, well, Dad, this is one that you're like, your kids teach you so much. She's like, well, Dad, I have a process for this. <laughs> I was like, well, okay, what's the process? She says, well, when I decide that I want something, I wait 30 days. And if after the 30 days I still want it, then I get it. I was like, that's brilliant. Okay. Uh, have you waited the 30 days on the ukulele? No, I've got 17 more days to go. Okay. <laughs> well, let me know when the 17 days are over and uh, we'll get you a ukulele, right? And so she picked one out. It was not a big investment. It was like $60. And she got a ukulele. 
And then I saw her go from having never touched a ukulele to being proficient in about two weeks. Wow. And I saw her on her own, find stuff on YouTube, right? Here's how you learn to do it. And practicing on her own. This is the way I was with sports. Like nobody had to tell me, go practice. I, they had to actually pull me off the streets, you know, at night, like come back in. And I think that's what you're really looking to foster in your child. What is the thing that they're so intrigued by, so interested in? And you just get to be the conduit to help that flourish. Um, and now she just transitioned to guitar. Um, oh, here's a good instinct one for you. So she said, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna learn to play guitar, you know? And uh, again, it was like she had already gone 28 days into the 30 day process. She was like, oh, well, tell me when you're ready. And so she's, uh, I definitely wanna go get a, t a guitar if I can. You know, she, she wasn't like demanding, but if I can. So we go to the guitar store. Laura, I don't, I don't know anything about guitars, right? So I asked the person to come in, help us out. And she was a little intimidated. Um, and so we walked in there, she's a little intimidated, kind of shy about it. And the guy says, well, take any guitar you want off. It's like a music room. Take any of the 50 guitars and try and play them and see how it feels. And so she was hesitating. And there was that part of me as a parent, which is like, because this is what I do for a living. This is what you do for a living, right? This is like helping people cross their barriers, their obstacles. So inside my head, I'm like thinking, well, just take any of the guitars. You just got to sit down and play. Like, it's so easy. But I see in her the apprehension. And I know it's not easy for her. Mm -hmm. And so I used the other technique that I talked about. I just went silent. Let her have her space, let her have her minute. You know, I said, well, boo, if you want, we can bring the guy in. Like we can ask him his thoughts on it. Gotta be patient. Gotta wait for her to get to there. Yeah, okay, let's bring him in. All right, bring him in. He explains all the stuff about the guitar. Say, okay, this one seems pretty good. It's kind of a starter guitar, a couple hundred bucks, you know, if you don't like it, et cetera. She tries it on, she kind of likes it. Doesn't love it though, right? And so the guy leaves, he's got to go do something else. And I said, doesn't seem like you quite love that one. You know, my intuition. And she said, I don't know, dad. Like, I think you're supposed to feel it. Like, I think, I think there's supposed to be something there. I said, all right, we'll stay here as long as you want to stay here. Well, we had decided before we got there that she wasn't going to get a used one, that she was going to get a new one. But she walks over, she's just walking the room in a circle. And she stops in front of this one rack, which is all the used guitars. She picks one off the rack and she plays it. Laura, mm -hmm. you can tell in a second. That guitar and that kid were supposed to cross paths across all of eternity and the entire cosmos, oh. right? <laughs> and she starts to play and she just starts to glow. Wow. The guitar is a little bit more expensive, but not that much more, right? And uh, she said to me, what do you think? Now, again, this is the moment. Like, all you got to do is be there for them. I said, boo, it seems like you and that guitar were made for each other. What do you think? And she just said, dad, this is the guitar. Wow, <laughs> that's beautiful. And uh, so we got it, you know? And so that's sort of the, the teenage version of the implementation of all these things where go silent at the right time, use your own intuition, let them use their intuition, let them make the call. And uh, yeah, and now she plays it like every day. I'm sitting there on the carpet in my living room. I turn around, here's my kid. She's had a guitar for like 26 hours and she's playing her first song. And here's her dad who literally, if you gave him 26 months, could not do that. And I'm just like in awe. Wow. Just absolutely in awe. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. These are long stories that I'm sharing, but man, thank you for asking the questions. So many happy moments for Aww. me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's, let me turn the tables on you. So you tell me one with you. Tell me something that you've done with your son that you looking back realize like that was one of the best things I've ever done. Or a memory that you're like, that is one of my favorite memories. Well, so my son and I, we have a song. Okay. Which is Let It Go from um, Frozen, the movie. Mm -hmm. And it's our song since he is, I think, one and a half. So when, when he was one and a half, because I really like that song. So I, it's, it's like, you really can sing along so good to that song. <laughs> and um, it's a Disney or a Pixar movie. Yeah. So, um, and since he's, he's one and a half, I am like dancing with him to the song. And I have him on my arms and we dance like through the entire living room. And I <laughs> like I am like you, I'm really not musically very talented. Um, and I know I'm not a good singer, 
But with this song, I just like, <laughs> I imagine myself. You belt it out as if you were the opera. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and it's so cute because of course the song is in English, so he didn't understand. Now he speaks a little bit of English, but he didn't. And he was always like singing along, and we were like just screaming and singing this song and dancing together. And until today, it's like when we have like at least. Every two days, we we dance and sing to that song. That is awesome. And um, now I have like my daughter and Tim, like both on my <laughs> arms, and we're like swirling uh, through the living room. And and it's and his face, the moment I put on the song, unbelievable. Yeah, that's so cool. You know, when you think about the currency of life that really matters to me, it's minutes. Yeah. And you're gonna have that. Mem you will. You will capture minutes when you're doing it. You will capture additional minutes every time you think about that moment. And it's so interesting because I'm like, even though I'm not like, I'm not a good singer or anything like that, but I connect with music, so many emotions. So whenever I hear this song, like the emotion, it's like, yeah. I can bring myself like this into this feeling of the connection I have with my son when I, when I hear that song. Yeah. Yes. The other thing that I love about that story is that you're not only are you having an awesome moment with him, you're showing him the joy of having awesome moments. Yeah. Yeah. You know, of being carefree, of being a goofball, of all that good stuff. Yeah. And there's, uh, I remember when we were in Hawaii and um, we have really good friends there and his best friend, like they're exactly the same age. So Eddie and him, and I put on the song and then her mom, uh, his mom took like Eddie on the arm and I took Carlo on the arm and we were like all four singing to it. And then also sharing this experiences with other people and mm. like dancing along and friend of mine, he took like a video and we had this video where it's, it's like one of the most beautiful <laughs> things. Or, yeah. Yeah, so it's very special to me. That is awesome. That's awesome. So I'll be curious to know when we talk, let's see, he's three now. So when we talk 15 years from now, after you give him the letters, if after he reads it, he remembers that. Yeah, I, I guess he will. E even if he doesn't consciously remember that, I bet that he will always have a connection to that song. I, I think so too. Yeah. 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 So what, what is on your, on your list? what we haven't discussed yet. Yeah, uh, so we talked a little, well, this is one of the things that we talked a little bit about some of the examples of it, the nighttime, the reading, but I love this idea. This is something that other women actually had suggested to me. So when I knew that I was gonna be a dad, I started asking women, what is the most important thing that I need to know? Because I knew that I was having a daughter. And what's the best thing that your father ever did for you? And there was a very interesting trend in the answers. Um, by far, one of the most important things they said was build their self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Because there will come a day when they have an asshole boss or an asshole guy, uh, and one of them is going to try and do something or get them to behave a particular way. And if they don't have the self-confidence, that will be one of the worst days of their life. So they said, make sure you help her build her self-confidence. And I took that to heart. The other thing they said was build traditions. And so they shared two with me as an example. One was the woman said, every Saturday, my dad and I would sit in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. like, and that was just their time. They would sit and talk and they would eat a happy meal and that was their thing. I really don't like McDonald's and I wouldn't want that food in my kids, so that's not my thing, but I took to heart the tradition aspect. Um, another one, one of the, my friends that I've been playing volleyball with for 10 years, I asked her and she said, you know, when I, <laughs> so I was like six or seven and I had like very little connection with my dad. She said, as a matter of fact, I was at the breakfast table. She said, and I remember saying to him, I like mommy, but I don't like you. <laughs> Can you imagine a little six or seven year old saying that? And to her dad's credit, he said, you know what? He said, I could really use some help today. And she said, what do you mean? And he said, I need some help picking out my tie today. And he invited her to look in his closet at all of his ties and to pick the tie that he would wear that day. And that tradition, she said, she was telling me the story. She's 52 years old and she started to cry. Oh. Yeah. She said, he let me pick out his tie. No matter what color his shirt was, he would put that tie on. No. Yeah. And he would wear that to work. Yeah. And so I took this to heart in the idea of creating traditions. Mm. Um, so, you know, Sophia Ball is a tradition. Reading at night is a tradition. The idea of being the king with the sheets and little stuffed animals is tradition. Um, oh, one of my favorite traditions of all time. 
when she was transitioning to from bath to, to shower. So when she was totally little, two, three, whatever, and she would take a bath, she'd be like, Daddy, do the voices. And so she would have all of these little dolls and orcas and the rest of those. And it was my job to tell the story. And I would do the voices. The orca would talk particularly, et cetera. But then there comes a time you're like, you want the kids to transition out of the bathtub into the shower. And she was kind of resisting that because I had created this total party that was doing voices, <laughs> right? And I was like, oh, I got to come up with something that'll make this a better transition. And so I came up with tales from the town of Budawasha. Wash your butt, basically. And so in the town of Budawasha, there was all these amazing people, including a little girl named Adventure and her favorite or her favorite, her best friend, which was a bat, which Sophia named Nightwing. And so I would invent these stories and I would sit on the floor facing the opposite direction from the shower. I could hear her showering and doing the rest of that. And I'd be telling stories, tales from the town of Budawasha. Oh. Yeah. And she loved these stories so much that and, and sh people would hear about this and they'd be like, well, give me an example. And I would tell them a story and they're like, oh my God, you're a writer. Why aren't you writing this down? And so I asked, this is an example of, of that relationship in building the trust. And honestly, like not to toot my own horn, but these were some pretty darn killer stories. And so I asked Sophia one day after someone had asked, would you write them down? I said, boo, I said, what are your thoughts on that? And she looked at me and she said, dad, I really want that just for you and me. Oh. And I said, that's it then. No problem. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, have you seen the movie? Um, what, what is the, uh, in, in, um, Great Britain, the bear. Um, oh, Paddington or? Pat, no, no, not Paddington. Um, it's like, it was like 1945, like the super famous. Oh, but, Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Thank you. Is it a bear? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, no, but what was interesting, the movie was about that the father was telling the son the story and then he was writing it and putting it out to the world and it, it destroyed completely the relationship yeah. the son had to his father. Yeah. So much that the son decided to go and fight in Second World War to be away from his father. Yeah. So I think it's beautiful that you like kept this between you and your daughter because i think sometimes yeah it's nice yeah. to share things but sometimes it's better to really keep it yeah and that to me is that trust uh, i think had i have broken that trust then then we wouldn't be having the kind you know when she's having her period or she's experiencing these questions about sexuality and boys and the rest of that like i don't think we'd be having those conversations because mm -hmm. i'd have broken that trust mm -hmm. something else would have been more important than the memories that we had I have one question, which I think is really interesting, the relationship with your father, because um, you like decided to do things differently than yeah. your father. What did, what, what was it inside of you that maybe did help you to, to also let go of the pain you maybe had in regarding to the behavior of your father? Because probably you said it, it, like it was traumatic yeah. for you because you're also like this auditive person. Yeah. And, um, so what, what was helping yourself to, to maybe change this circle of her people, her people? I think the part of it is recognizing that everyone is doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. And so as a kid, you see the world through a particular lens, but you don't understand the stress maybe that your parents are under, you know, 26 years old, three kids under five, trying to run his business so that he could provide for his family. Mm -hmm had never been exposed to the world of self-development because back then there was no self-development. Yes. Yeah. And so it's a little bit unfair for me to judge his behavior through the lens of my life experiences and today's access to information. Mm -hmm. Like he just, that wasn't part of the story. Uh, so I think it's, it's being compassionate as part of it. I would say using my intuitive moments here that one of the, one of the, and this, this takes a leap of faith, so I'm not saying it's easy to do, but this helps me is in Safari des Liebens, I talk about that everyone is an actor in our play. And if you think about a soul constellation, that for my father to agree to play the role of the man who yelled so that I could learn to be the man who didn't yell and be that kind of father and get to have this relationship with my kid. It's like, do you realize how much he suffered in that role so that I could get to be this role. And when I can allow myself to think of that in that context, 
I'm grateful as opposed to resentful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. This is something I also believe very much in. Do you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And where does that come from? Where does that belief stem from? I don't know. I think it, it was path of a uh, part of my own spiritual path okay. of, to, to just recognize that everyone is that life is for you. Every experience is for you. It's nothing. It's all for you to grow and to remember who you are and how you want to be. And that it, um, yeah, it's a lot about also self responsibility, how you want to walk through life, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you, we had one recently. Um, I, I was doing a, a meet and greet with someone and they shared this really powerful story their father had committed suicide when they were eight years old. And now as, as we were talking in the meet and greet and getting to know this, this young person, they were saying that they had a friend who had been very depressed and uh, suicidal and that it was because of her experiences that she went through with her dad that she was able to counsel this friend and be there for this friend. And so I shared the same concept with her and I, and I, I said, imagine what your dad gave up to never get his to never get the chance to see his daughter after the age of eight. And maybe he gave all of that up so that you could be there, so that this friend of yours wouldn't take their own life. Like if we can reframe it in that context, it just changes it all. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that you if it's someone who's who's done something difficult to you, I'm not saying you want to stay in that space. I'm just saying that for me, this helps me reframe things a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's totally my philosophy of life. Thank you. Is there anything more you want to share that is important to you? Uh, let's see. This one is since you've got little, little ones. Uh, this is this is something that is really important. And that is that, and I think you know this already because I think we've talked about it and just because of the person that you are, it goes by so fast, mm. you know? Like right now you can pick them up and you can carry them. I can't do that with my kid anymore. Couldn't do it f since she was seven. And so there's moments when you're tired <laughs> and your little one is like, daddy, carry me. And you're just like, oh, I'm not sure if I got that left in me today, you know? Or you're on a hike in the, in the mountains and you're about 42 steps into the hike. <laughs> Can you carry me, you know? Um, and I guess my point is that there is going to come a day for every parent and it happens so fast where you don't get to carry them anymore. Mm. And one of my favorite things in the world when she was little was she would say, she was so little that she couldn't speak correctly yet and she was building up to that. And she would toddle into my office and she would take her arms and she'd be like this. And she would say, daddy hold you, mm. daddy hold you, <laughs> you know? And so my point is that enjoy those moments while you got them because you're only gonna get them for a certain amount of years and then you're never gonna have them again. In that same spirit, when she used to go to bed, she used to, I wrote about this in, in the book, What I've Learned, that things we love come to an end. And there was a time when every night, daddy, can I have three hugs and seven kisses? Three hugs and seven kisses, or it was three kisses and seven hugs, I can't remember, but it was, I think it was three hugs and seven kisses. And then there's a night when it doesn't happen anymore and then it never happens again. And it's very easy in those moments to be thinking about what's in your inbox, to be thinking about what you've got on the schedule tomorrow, to be, but if you just allow yourself to embrace and be in that moment, then when the moment ends, you have no regrets. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I know you answered that question already twice in my podcast, but I'm going to, uh, to ask it again. It's two questions actually that I would like to ask. So the first one is um, maybe in regards to growing up children, what, what role plays spirituality for you in educating your children? It's interesting because I for sure have not gotten it all figured out. I mean, it's a work in progress for me, just like it is for everybody else. I do my best to introduce concepts without making it seem like this is the final answer. And so I will introduce as, well, this is what I think. And then I will turn it around at, well, what do you think? You know, because again, they have just as much to share with us as we have to share with them. Uh, and so the idea that 
there's more to this game, the cosmic algorithm of the universe. That <laughs> yeah, your we actions, talked about that yeah, before, yeah. Your actions are demonstrating to the algorithm what your interests are, and therefore you get more of what you're acting upon. Uh, I think it's great to share that stuff. Um, <laughs> there was one, we were going to go to Africa. And so in order to go to Africa, you have to get the shots, the yellow fever, typhoid, all the rest of that stuff. And so I shared with her a concept called um, don't let the small things keep you from the big things. And we talked about it. She understood it. And I said, this is a small thing. We're going to go there. We're going to get shots. I know it's going to hurt. I don't like shots either. So again, being vulnerable, right? I know it's going to hurt. I don't like that either. But in order for us to go to Africa, are you looking forward to going to Africa? What are you most looking forward to? Right? Like them, let them spit it back to you. Okay, here we go. And we'll get ice cream afterwards, right? <laughs> Whatever is sort of the payoff. And so we go there and she's so brave and she gets her shots. I get my shots. We go to Africa. We have this amazing time. We spent a year backpacking around the world. And when we came back, she enters kindergarten and I go to the first parent teacher conference and the teacher pulls me to the side. She says, I have the cutest story to tell you. She said, Sophia was in class and there was a little girl and she broke something. It was a crayon or something else. And Sophia came up and she put her arm around her and she said, it's okay. You can't let the small stuff keep you from the big stuff. <laughs> and so I think these big <laughs> concepts of spirituality, of ways to approach life, of how to win the game of life can be demonstrated in our everyday, even through the small things like mm. that. You know. Thank you. What's your take on that? I would love to hear your take on that. On spirituality yeah. and uh, raising children. Yeah. Because you are, you are someone, uh, one, I, I admire many, many things about you. One of the things I most admire is your ability to be grounded, to stay connected, um, and to be in that moment. And so I would love to know just what, how did you get there? That's probably a long answer, and I would love to hear it. And then what is your strategy or the methodology by which you share that with your kids? Well, I think... The, the best way how to teach children anything is to live it yourself. Yeah. So I try to live my way of being spiritual, spiritual being in this human experience as good as I can. And I try to be super quick for giving. Um, I try to, to practice gratitude. I mean, with my son every night before he goes to sleep, I go with him through the day. So I tell him his day. This is like our story. So um, he always goes like, Mama, tell me my day. So I always start like, okay, this morning you woke up and you came to me, you give me a hug and a kiss. And then I go like with him through the entire day, I tell him everything he did. And then I always ask him at the end, like, so what was the most favorite thing of this day? And then he picks something. And it's always so funny because sometimes it's, I would never have thought about that this was like this thing, what he's most grateful for. Yeah. Um, so this is something where I try to teach him how how to look back to your day and what to focus on and what to let go maybe and um yeah i i really try to as good as i can i mean i'm far from perfect i i just try to to live like to walk the talk kind of and i think this is the way he he learns the best by seeing me to be um calm in moments where maybe someone else would freak out or to okay. be to be kind to other people to be to be open to be um loving yeah. Is there something that he sees you do, a, a daily meditation practice, anything that you have as part of your grounding methodology that he um, sees you do, well, even if I, it's not with him? I would wish that he would see me meditate every day. Um, <laughs> you wish I, that you were meditating every day. This yeah. is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, but um, no, but what I do is when I do yoga, I do it with him together. So okay. he does yoga with me, for example, and then I always ask him also to sit down and to put his hands together and to take a breath and to connect with his body. So this is something we do together. And I med when I meditate, I also meditate with the kids around me. So oh, cool. Um, yeah. So they when I do it, they see me doing it. Yeah. But I this is something I, I I'm working on to really come back also to my own meditation practice because I lost it kind of in the last 
years. <laughs> <laughs> well, with two little ones at home yeah, and everything that you've difficult. got going, uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, 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 no doubt. No, but I think it's 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 all about like really living what you want them to be because yeah. they don't hear what they what you say. They they see what you do, and this is what they will live by. I totally so agree. So this is what what I try to just be the best person I can possibly possibly be for them. So, and what I also do, um, what I didn't had when I was a child, like there was never that my parents like expressed verbally that they love us. So oh. that, that didn't exist. And like, I don't know how many times a day I tell my son and my, my daughter how much I love them. Yeah. And it's just when I left um, my son was such a beautiful moment. I, I I gave him a kiss. He was on the couch. I gave him a kiss. I said, okay, I will come back later. I, I got to work. And I went to the door and then I hear, mama, wait. And then he came running to me and he said, mom, I want to give you a hug. And then he hugged me. And then he said, I want to hug you a little bit more. And then he <laughs> hugged me even more. And then he said, mama, I love you. Wow. Yeah, it was so beautiful. And then he gave me a kiss and then he, he went back. I so we that. have like this very... I think it's for me it's the most important thing to tell people I love that I love them and I, I really do this with my kids so much. And how fantastic that that is not the environment that you grew up in and yet you were able to say to yourself this is who I want to be and this is the way in which I want them to experience. Yeah, but it's very up similar to your experience because this was yeah. what I was missing the most when yeah. I was a kid that someone just goes to you and says to you like I love you you're good the way you are yeah. and that you don't have to fight for it kind of. So I have a question to you related to that, which is, I was in an airport one time. It's funny the things that you can learn in random moments that then you carry forward for the rest of your life. So I was in an airport one time waiting for my flight and there was a lady that was sitting not too far away from me. Business closed, obviously it worked all week. It was a Friday away from her kids, I'm sure all week long. And I heard her on the phone and she was saying, can you tell mommy you love me? Can you tell mommy you love me? Ooh. And I don't even think I was a parent at that point, but I, I felt such sadness for her because I could tell she was so hurting, you know? And I knew how much she wanted to hear that in that moment. And yet my intuition was saying to me that if that's the way you have to get the I love you, Oof, yeah. it's not going to be the I love you that you want. Mm -hmm. And I think what I took from that and what I've tried to employ in my life is that give it when you feel it. Mm -hmm. And when they feel it, they're going to give it back. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really interesting because just yesterday I had a conversation with this um, about this uh, with with my nanny, um, and we were talking about how very often, when, for example, a relationship is not going well from the parents, that very often the parents take the kids to kind of fulfill their need of love that mm. their partner is not giving to them. And this is putting the children like in a really difficult situation because yeah. they kind of have to, um, yeah, fulfill something they cannot. And mm -hmm. um, and because like my nanny, she told me that her father, they like their parents were like fighting all the time. It was like very, very difficult. And the father was always using her, her brothers to go like hunting with him, fishing with him and was like really angry at his sons when they wouldn't want to come along but yeah. he didn't want them to come along he just wanted to fulfill his need of having someone close yeah. to him and her mother was using her as a cushion like between her father and her and I mean this is maybe even kind of emotional abuse for a child I would even say and I think this is something you have to be super aware of yeah if you like use your child to get like that your inner child is getting the love that yeah. uh, that you're missing. Yeah. Well, and I'm so happy you raised that story uh, because this is one of the things for everyone who's thinking about being a parent and isn't quite there yet. Here's one of the biggest falsehoods, in my opinion, based on my experience of parenting. You see all of these pictures of the brand new newborns and they're just like a bundle of love. They are just perfect in that moment in the picture because it's for the baby food commercials and for the diaper commercials and the rest of that. And I think part of the reason that some people feel called to be a parent is because they want that love that's missing in their life. And they're hoping that this little human being, mm -hmm. because it's everywhere in commercialism, is going to bring you that love. So let me see if I can very gently, but very truthfully, and again, feel free to add in if, if you felt this, notice this, that first year, you're going to be giving everything. The child does not have the capacity yet to be giving back to you. Maybe a tiny bit emotionally, tiny bit mentally, but 
they're not going to just walk up to you and wrap you in their arms at that point. You're going to be making food for them. You're going to be changing their diaper. You're going to be having fun with them, but they are not going to be the source of the giving mm. for quite a long time. And so if that is your expectation going in, I think you're going to be radically disappointed. And if you allow it to happen organically, though, it will be one of the most beautiful things ever. The first moment I knew that Sophia loved me, she was not yet walking, so probably closing in on that year. And we were laying on the carpet together. And I was like, I was like this and I was making faces and she was like looking at me and making faces and we were having fun and she was giggling. And she reached up with her two tiny hands and she put them on the side of my head and she touched her forehead to my forehead. And I can tell you as sure as if she was saying it out loud at a thousand decibels, I knew for sure what she was saying is, I love you, daddy. And that's the moment that you want to get as opposed to trying to get them to give it to you. So, Beautiful. Yeah. I don't know, did you, have you, you've got, yours are so little still, you know, I mean, has that been your experience that at the start, it's really you, you're doing everything for them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Like the worst thing you can do is wanting to have a child so that they give you the love you didn't have in your life. <laughs> like yeah. this is like, already then planned drama for the rest of your life because <laughs> it's not their job. It's, yeah. it's not what they're there for. Like, yeah. Yeah. You are their guidance. Like you are the one who have, has to create them like the space of love where they can grow. It's not their thing to bring you the love. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think this is a really good point to-, to So someone's that. sensing that after hearing this conversation, listen, you're totally worthy of that love. And if you allow yourself to figure out how to love yourself first, you're going to love being a parent that yeah. much more when you eventually do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, final question. Imagine it's the last day of your life. So yeah. you have a beautiful, beautiful, long life. So many beautiful, more experiences with your daughter. So many good interviews with me. <laughs> and <laughs> we just completed uh, interview number 7,428 <laughs> with Laura Molina Siler, ladies and gentlemen. These two are so old, we're not even sure how they can still sit up in their chairs, but somehow they're doing it. Yeah. I would love to do that when, when we are like really old, to sit oh on my the gosh. veranda somewhere and, and just. You're going to be riff asking me the life. question, I'm going to be like, what? <laughs> Can you say it again? <laughs> You'll ask it again. I'll be sleeping at that moment. Okay, but, but okay, so let's not imagine, quite that far. Let's yeah. imagine this is the day. Okay, we're both really, really old. We're sitting somewhere on a on a porch, having a glass of good cacao, and um, everything you ever did is deleted. So there are no more books from you. Like yeah. nothing. Our podcast is deleted. And I would ask you if you could give three advices or what are your three wisdoms when it comes to raising a child if nothing else you ever said would be left in the world and i would give you a white sheet of paper and a pen and you could write them down what, what would you write down to my child specifically no in general like to raising but yeah let me think about it <laughs> let's make it two let's, okay. let's make I it get what, two what, pieces of what, paper okay you get two pieces of paper what be what would be the three things you would tell your daughter and what would be the three things you would tell someone who raises a child? Okay, so I'll start with the raise the child first because yes. I know I'm gonna get emotional when I tell the second one. So uh, three things that I would tell someone else, which is allow yourself to be the biggest goofball ever in raising mm -hmm. your kid. Have so much fun with it that when you look back, you think to yourself, I'm so glad that I did it that way. Um, the second thing that I would say is that, this is very tactical, but my intuition said to say it. So. Um, add 30 seconds. And what I mean by that is that when you're helping your kid figure something out, when you're helping them learn to buckle their car seat, when they want to prove to you that they can do something, you as an adult already know how to do it. But if you give them just 30 extra seconds between when they say that they can do it and when you feel that they should have it done, mm. it will be so much easier on you and they will gain so much self-confidence. So add 30 seconds. And then the third thing I would say is it doesn't start later. And that, that relationship, that bond starts on day one. Yeah. And so demonstrate right from the beginning 
who you want to be as a parent to them and even the smallest of things. And I'll give one example of that too. Uh, I wanted my daughter to know that I was so happy that she was my kid. And so I made the decision when she was super, super, like just got her home from the hospital type tiny. It's 2.30 in the morning. It's my turn to feed her. <laughs> I'm running on massive sleep deprivation and she's crying in the middle of the night and I get out of bed to go over to the bassinet. And I made the conscious decision that before she would see me, I would smile. So that the minute she saw my face, the cognitive awareness would be, he's happy that I'm here. And I think if you can allow yourself to do that right from the beginning and continue that on so that when they walk into your room and they're five or they're 10 or they're 15, no matter what you're doing, that you can stop and turn and smile and let them know that you're happy that they're there. Thank you. So that's my three for the piece of paper. For your daughter? I'm already crying. <laughs> um, three for my daughter. Topping list would be, I am so happy that you picked me to be your dad. Because I really do think that's the way it works. I think that your little soul is out there and they're looking around and they're like, eh, I get to pick anybody to be my parents. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. Who am I going to pick? And then they pick you. <laughs> and they arrive with their own story. And they arrive with their own energy, their own challenges. And our job is to be the support for them and to be the guide for them where we can, to be the receiving of the information where we can. And so I actually use that exact, you talked about how do you let her know? I say that to my daughter all the time. Thank you so much for choosing me to be your dad. Yeah. Um, so I would tell her that. I would tell her, I will love you through all of infinity. So there will be a time when I'm not here anymore, but I will always love you. And I would say, out of everything that I've, ever done in my entire life. The thing that I am most, most happy about is that we got to spend the time together that we did. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Do I get so to hear your piece of paper? Hmm? Do I get to Mine? hear your piece of paper? Oh, I think I cannot do that right now. <laughs> 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 but I guess it will be very similar. We'll do that in the next round of interviews. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere before number 2,742. <laughs> I think I, I would have like an emotional breakdown right now. <laughs> no, but um, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Because I'll tell you. Uh, you know, my hope is that there's somebody out there who's watching this, listening to this, and they know in their heart of hearts they want to be a mommy or they want to be a daddy. And it can be truly one of the greatest things ever. And I hope that something in our conversation and our experiences as a mommy, as a daddy, um, either gives you that confidence to say, yeah, I want to do this, or helps you in some way have the relationship that you want to have with your kids. So thank you for the invitation to be a part of this. Thank you, John, for everything. First of all, for our friendship. And I, I think it's so beautiful how our paths are crossing again yeah. and again and how we are like getting deeper and deeper into, into this connection, which I think is so special and beautiful. And I have the feeling every time we sit down to talk about a topic, it's, it's so magical and it's so um, healing on so many levels. So... Just thank you for, for being you. Thank you for being so vulnerable. Thank you for being such an amazing dad. I, I, I really, when we had that dinner, I was so inspired by you, really. And thank I you. think this is something so healing also for women to have a father who is so in this presence of love, because this is actually what I think heals so much because so, so many women are so hurt because the relationship to their fathers are, mm. are broken. Mm. Yeah. So just thank you. And um, I hope to meet your daughter one day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we will sit down probably next year and talk about, I don't know, let's see what, what will come <laughs> up <laughs> when you have your next book. They, um, 
for all for everybody who's watching or listening, if you're like, I'm so happy they talked about that, and I would love to hear about this, then you can send Laura a message yeah, or send yeah, me a message. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, John, for everything for thank being you. you and yeah, thank you. So much. Yeah, right back at you, my friend. Willkommen zurück. Ich hoffe, du konntest ganz, ganz viel für dich mitnehmen immer aus diesem wunderschönen Gespräch und wahrscheinlich hattest du auch ein paar Mal Tränen in den Augen und ich würde mich riesig freuen, wenn wir uns bei Instagram hören at Laura Marlina Seiler und du mir deine Gedanken zu der Folge heute da lässt und ähm, ja, dich dir hoffentlich ganz bewegen konnte und vielleicht den ein oder anderen neuen Impuls gegeben hat, wie wir Kinder erziehen können und selbst wenn du keine Kinder hast, kennst du Menschen, die Kinder haben und teil die Folge einfach unglaublich gerne, damit ja so viele Kinder wie möglich einfach total erfüllt, bestärkt und voller Verbindung zu ihrer eigenen Schöpferkraft aufwachsen können. Und wie vorhin im Intro schon gesagt, mein Online-Kurs I Am, wie du deine Lebensvision findest, ist wieder offen. Du kannst dich jetzt dafür anmelden, den Kurs komplett in deiner eigenen Zeit machen und es geht dabei wirklich darum, wie du herausfindest, was will ich in meinen einzelnen Lebensbereichen leben und erschaffen und wer darf ich dadurch werden. So ein wunderschöner Kurs mit ganz viel Maui Love Energy auf jeden Fall. Link findest du in der Bio. Und außerdem ist die 13. Ausgabe von meinem IM Magazin endlich wieder da. Also das heißt wieder da. Sie ist das erste Mal da. Die 13. Ausgabe ist jetzt da mit dem Titelthema Weniger Angst, mehr Liebe. Und das IM Magazin bekommst du überall, wo es Magazine gibt. Du kannst du online bestellen. Den Link dazu findest du auch in den Show Notes. Und ähm, das Magazin ist tatsächlich wie so ein, ist jedes Mal wie so ein, Workbook, wie so ein wunderschönes Workbook, was dich mitnimmt in unterschiedliche Themen. Und unter anderem geht es um die Mondphasen jetzt in dem Magazin, wie du die Mondphasen zum Manifestieren nutzen kannst. Es geht um die Liebe, es geht darum, wie wir resilienter werden können oder uns mit unserer eigenen Resilienz verbinden können. Also schau da rein, falls du planst, in den Urlaub zu fahren, nimm dir das Magazin mit. Das ist auf jeden Fall sehr, ja, ich bin da immer richtig stolz drauf, das ist wirklich so... So mein Baby. Also I am ist da, das Magazin ist da, der Kurs ist da, alles gerade auf I am. Viel, viel Freude damit, viel Spaß damit. Und ich freue mich, wenn wir uns bei Instagram hören. Ich hoffe von Herzen, dass es dir gut geht. Vielen, vielen Dank für all den Support, den der Podcast hier auch bekommt. Happy, holy and confident. Und ja, fühle dich von Herzen umarmt. Geh mit erhobenem Hauptes durch dein Leben und lass das Leben dich leiten und führen. Es ist so schön, dass es dich gibt. Rock on, Namaste, deine Laura.